Two mercenaries try to go legit in a town where the law is on the wrong side of justice. Folly Pops is full of human-like creatures who enjoy many familiar modern conveniences within a fantasy setting. Tawny is a hero for hire who excels at finding new ways to get chased out of town. Her partner, Dudu, has an extraordinary bag that produces what you need, but not necessarily what you want. Tawny and Dudu must unite both citizens and soldiers to face an impending invasion. Tawny must earn the respect of the townsfolk and the presidential guard before their childish leader sells them out for good. So pack Folly Pops today and be a part of the adventure. Hello again, everybody. I'm Scott Ball. That's Georgia Ball. Welcome to another episode of Bounce Off. This is a very special episode of Bounce Off. We're, we've been kind of wanting to do this episode since the beginning of when we started thinking about doing Bounce Off as a podcast. And um, prior, before I get into that, prior to that, you did this, you just saw our promotional for our Kickstarter. Uh, for Folly Pops, a project that Georgia and I uh, have been working on for quite some time. And uh, it's a, uh, an adventure story. In fact, I'm going to let you, you say a sentence about it because you do it better than I do, Georgia. So go ahead and explain just briefly what Folly Pops is. Uh, it's a story about an uh, adventure story of two mercenaries who go to a, a town with the intention of uh, just getting some work done, but then uh, decide to go legit and end up finding themselves in the middle of a revolution. So this is a, a 90 page graphic novel. Um, and again, it's available through Kickstarter to pledge for. If it pledges enough, then it will get made. If not, then I'm done. So <laughs> uh, I had somebody write me and say they couldn't wait to find out why one of the mercenaries is a stuffed rabbit. Well, you have to get the book made to find out why. That's right. And you, you know, th that origin story is in the book. So, um, but uh, uh, very excited about this book. We are also, I should say, we're very pleased and, and touched by the support that we've gotten, for, particularly from all the people that we know up to this point. It's been really, really great, almost kind of like a reunion of sorts. Uh, hearing from people yeah. I haven't heard from quite a while, just coming in and supporting it. Um, but we also we need the we need the support of the rest of you too, um, and uh, that's important as well. So please go to the Kickstarter page. Just check it out, even if you're not going to buy. Just go see what some of the stuff that we do. And um, George has got a long pedigree of uh, writing for comics, and I've done some uh, art and comics as well. You might be familiar with her work in Scholastic, adapting the Ice Ride series. And she also wrote the adaptation for the Clifford the Big Red Dog movie graphic novel that came out this last Christmas. So yeah, go, go check it out um, after this podcast and just go see what you think of it. Okay, all that done and aside, what we have here today as this very special guest is the one and only John Lustig. Thank you for being here, John. Well, thank you for having me. I Now that I'm on the internet, I officially exist. So, <laughs> so Georgia and I have known John and his wife, Sheila, for uh, many years. We used to live in Seattle and uh, that's the kind of, that's the area that he lives in. He lives in the Seattle area. And um, I uh, lived so, in Seattle. You lived in the Seattle area. <laughs> <laughs> I was not, I was just going to try to be general about it. Uh, yeah. I'm not about to give you them your address. But, um, uh, but uh, yeah, we, so we've known him for many years and um, uh, I, I'm just going to read my little spiel here because it's better than if I don't paraphrase it. I just want to get it down right. So John Lustig has had an illustrious career writing yeah. comics that has spanned decades. His primary success has been working with Disney publishers on stories featuring the family of Donald Ducks that populate the fictional town of Duckburg. John has also spent the last several decades focused on his own personal project, Last Kiss, which is a parody comic on love and relationships. And I, some of the stories, I, I didn't get all of them down, but some of the stories that you've worked, that you've written include Stampede and Deliver, It's Batsman, Can You Imagine Melvin, and Romance at a Glance. And, I, and I'm thinking, John, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I don't think all of those stories are Disney stories. Is that correct? No, those are all Disney stories. Oh. And three of the four are by William, uh, drawn by William Van Horn and 
okay, uh, gosh, I'm blanking on the other uh, creator, but yeah, yeah, those are all Disney stories. Even, okay. Even Great. the likely Melvin story. <laughs> okay, so the main topic that we're going to be talking about today is indeed uh, Carl Barks, the one and only. So, um, and John is here to talk to us a little bit about it because not only through your uh, many years as writing for uh, comics, uh, you've gotten to write for a lot. Um, you've gotten to team up with a lot of different stars as far as from the Disney comics uh, era. And none, none's greater than Carl Barks. So you actually kind of became friends with Carl Barks. You knew him personally. Yes. Um, let's see. Um, I guess the way to start is to explain how I met Carl. Um, uh, let's see. In 1991, uh, Carl had turned 90. And I... Um, I've gotten his address and I decided to write him, um, you know, happy birthday. Oh, by the way, uh, I, I do Disney comics too. And so does my friend, Bill Van Horn. And we'd love to come down and meet you sometime. <laughs> and um, I did not know if I'd hear back at all. And he was uh, supposed to be somewhat of a recluse uh, or at least guard his privacy very carefully. Um, so, and I've got to be just a little bit crude here to get the proper emphasis in the story um, or details. So maybe a couple weeks, a week and a half later, um, I'm, okay, here I go being, this is me being a little bit crude. I'm in the bathroom, sitting in the bathroom, doing what one sits does when one sits in the bathroom. And Sheila comes up to the bathroom door and she's just gone out to the post office and she says, honey, you got to see this. And she slips an envelope underneath sure. the door and it says it's from Carl Barks. Wow. And I'm sitting there and I'm going... <laughs> This is a holy document. What do I do? I don't want. <laughs> so anyway, when I finally, a few minutes, some, shortly after that, I, I opened the letter and, and, and it is a letter from Carl and he was very friendly and he said, sure, you and Bill come on down. So, um, and uh, I called Bill and he goes, yeah, I'm, I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, so I called and I got, I had Carl's phone number um, and I called down and I did not expect to get Carl because I've heard so many, over so many years that he's hard of hearing and didn't, you know, doesn't like to talk on the phone and so forth. Uh, I thought I'd probably get Gary. Um, by the way, Gary, it's G-A-R-E apostrophe, uh, is short for Margaret. Apparently, when Gary was in school, there were like multiple Margarets in one of her classes. And so everybody had to change their name somewhat. So, <laughs> and, that, and that's Carl yeah, Barks' that. wife you're referring right. to. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes. Now, I expected Gary to pick up. Uh, instead, Carl did. And I'm kind of got, uh, uh, uh. And uh, so, so we made arrangements. And yes, it was fine for us to bring down, Carl, for Bill and I to bring down our wives, Bill's wife, Elaine, and uh, she, my wife, Sheila. And so we drove down and we got there in the late afternoon or Early, I think it was late afternoon, early evening, and we called up to the house, and uh, they had us up for drinks. Um, uh, I think everybody else had beer, but I hate beer, so I, I don't know what I had. Um, anyway, and... Um, so yeah, I think you just was, revealed some news there that, so Carl Barks is a beer drinker, huh? Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's what he had, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I'll be front page news. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, 
anyway, and uh, it was, and then so we went back to our motels uh, rooms, and uh, the next uh, day we had uh, lunch with them. Maybe I don't know if we had met them earlier in the day, but we had lunch and uh, at Elmer's, uh, their favorite restaurant. Oh, I love Elmer's. Elmer's. I remember Elmer's. He loved El. Oh. They loved Elmer's. They had an Elmer's just down the hill from their house. No kidding. I mean, yeah. there's not a lot of Elmer's. Anymore. So for anyone oh. out there, I'm like, what the heck is Elmer's? That sounds, that's glue, right? Um, <laughs> no, it's, it's a little bit like a... a that's uh, what the food's like. No, no. <laughs> it's a little oh, bit fine. like a, a Bob Evans. Um, okay. Also a little bit like a Cracker Barrel, but not more like a Bob Evans, more like a... Um, like like a Shoney style or or something like that or I don't shows. know any of those but okay Village Inn mm-hmm. I get it okay um, and um, there's a little bit from that that I'll bring in later in the interview because um, I know there's one question you want to ask me that it'll be germane to but um, um, let's see. Um, for those of you who don't know too much about Barks and uh, his wife, Gary, Gary uh, was missing her lower left or her left arm. And uh, she, it, it, uh, she lost it in an auto accident. And she, and I know at some point you're gonna be showing a picture of all this, but um, Gary always managed to, to move herself so that her left appendage uh, wasn't, her left shoulder wasn't uh, real apparent. And uh, um, anyway, um, and she was a a talented artist on her own right. Um, She, uh, among other things, she she lettered uh, Carl's uh, artwork after they uh, got together. And uh, Gary was, his third wife, and certainly um, it was the happiest of the three marriages, from what I can understand. And um, okay. so, well, let's uh, let's back it up a little bit further because sure. I, I want to before we get further into Carl Barks, I wanted to ask you just one more question about how you got your career started. Okay. And so, sure. I, I believe you actually did not start with uh, no. Disney comics. You actually started with Looney Tunes. I started with Daffy Duck. Yes. Um, How did that happen? How did you get a Daffy Duck? uh, Well, I was actually still in college. Um, I was in college forever, but I was still in college and um, I'd always wanted to write uh, comics. And by that time I was a Barks fan, but um, so I was going through writer's uh, market and um, there was a listing for Western Publishing, which was most people would know it better as Gold Key or Dell Comics. And um, they were open to submissions. And so I wrote uh, and I got a letter back from Dell Cannell, uh, who Carl knew. Um, and he, uh, you know, said, this is what you do. And I had wanted to do Disney. He said, no, you can't do that, but you could do this or this, whatever. And um, so I wrote a Daffy story. I think it was five pages. And um, they changed a tiny bit, but for the most part, it went through unchanged. And I was in seventh heaven. But um, then I wrote a second one, which was absurdly ambitious, and Dell didn't care for it, but he gave me some suggestions. Unfortunately, by that time, I had graduated. I mean, good that I graduated, but um, the but I got my first newspaper job, and I was working fifty to sixty hours a week, getting paid for my like 20, it seemed like. Uh, <laughs> before that, I'd been working at Sears and I actually took a pay cut to get my first newspaper job uh, as a reporter. Wow. Uh, yeah, it hurt. Uh, um, and I just I just didn't have the time or energy 
anyway, I didn't get back and I wish I had. I, if I had to do it over again, that's one of the things I would have somehow made happen. But Made uh, what happen? Well, I would have kept going with uh, uh, Gold Key if I could have. I, oh, I would okay. Have, yeah. Um, and uh, so I was a reporter for close to 10 years, uh, reporter, columnist, um, editor, uh, for a little while, uh, co-publisher um, and photographer. Uh, we did a little bit of everything when you were in the weekly newspaper business. And it was great training, but um, at some point um, I needed to make a change and I decided I wanted to get back into comics. And so I started going to comic book conventions and I started writing for Comic Buyer's Guide, doing interviews and, um, and uh, Fanographics a little bit, um, and uh, which got me to know some people. But um, I was at the San Diego Comic Con, uh, which most people these days know as Comic Con International. And uh, I went up to a booth called Blackthorn. Um, and this is in the, let's see, it'd be in the, early to mid, mid 80, no, it'd be mid 80s. And they, it was during the black and white boom of comics and they had um, all these ripoffs of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And I went up and I talked to them and I'm sorry, this is a long story. Um, and I said, I'd like to write something for them. And I say, oh, would you like to write Teenage Mutant Ninja uh, gerbils or whatever it was. And I said, well, if I have to, I can, but I see you publish Nervous Rex and I really like that. And, and it was uh, uh, written and drawn by Bill Van, William Van Horn, uh, Bill to me. And, um, and I said, I, but I'd rather write something for that, for that. And he said, well, uh, Bill's, Bill's accepting, uh, um, you know, ideas, you know, could pitch him some ideas. I don't think any, I don't know if he even talked it over with Bill. I mean, he, <laughs> thinking about it, because uh, it never made any sense to me that uh, Bill was open to ideas, but I sent him some ideas. He liked them. I used two of them in what Nervous Rex number 10, and uh, which turned out to be the last regular issue. And uh, meanwhile, um, I knew Bill was interested in working for Disney once Gladstone started. Uh, and by then, with Gladstone, the first person, uh, freelancer they hired was um, uh, 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 Don. Um, Don Rosa. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> this won't well, be the that guy's name again. This won't be the first time I go I go dry on somebody's name. I know. Um, <laughs> and anyway, he um, uh, so and Bill doesn't like to travel. He does. He hates flying. And so I was down at the San Diego Comic Con. I got information for him about uh, submitting to. Uh, Gladstone and he did and they hired him and Bill said um, do you want to do you want to write some stuff too too and I so I started writing story first one in pagers and then two pagers then longer pieces um, uh, and I was submitting directly to Bill instead of the editor uh, Byron Erickson and eventually I've been doing it enough that I was submitting directly to Byron, and uh, that's pretty much how I got into doing uh, the Disney Ducks. Wow. Huh. I mean, everyone's got their own little story as to how they break in and all that, and it's all, all of them are a little bit different and a little bit unique in that way. But, right, right, right. Um, that's, you know, it's not that easy to break in, I think. I'm not saying it was then an easy thing then either, but it's even yeah. harder now, I think. 
So it's, I, oh, there's, there's just less being made. That, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's that. Okay. Uh, so, um, so as we had mentioned before, you did, you knew Carl Barks and that you, you talked about going down and uh, visiting him um, at his home in right. Oregon. And um, I'm curious, what was Carl Barks really like as a person? What was, what was his personality like? Uh, <laughs> well, I'm very tempted to um, create stuff that didn't happen, like we all sat on whoopee cushions. But um, um, <laughs> no, he was a very, and, and as you can see in that picture, uh, you can't see uh, Gary's uh, missing arm there. Anyway, um, he was um, he was a real he was a gentleman. He was very courteous. He was, uh, despite his um, uh, the legend almost of him being um, uh, a recluse. He was very friendly. Um, um, I don't think he met a lot of people in the business these days, you know? So he was curious about us. And um, uh, okay. let's see what, what else? Um, he, did he... Did he have much of an, of an ego as far as like with his success? No, I don't... It... No, no, he wasn't very full of himself. Um, um, that's actually something that strikes me about both him and Van Horn. They both knew their work worth, but um, they didn't have a big ego. I, I mean, Carl knew by then, and, and Bill wasn't a, you know a, a legend at that point. But um, but Carl knew knew his worth for sure. He knew he was a legend. He knew that. Um, Gary, on numerous times, had to uh, protect him from the public. Um, he, um, let's see. Well, when we, we went there, Gary answered the door and Carl was behind. And apparently that was very typical. Um, she was sort of the garden, mm. um, the dragon at the door. And it almost seemed like they would, they, they'd have instances where people would just show up. Like they find out I where have he a lives show up. I have Is that a true? Okay. Um, um, apparent, you know, and, and Carl's work was much bigger and better known in uh, Europe than it was in the U.S. for reasons we'll probably talk about later. But um, so they got a call from somebody. I don't know if it was a fan or I got the impression it was a journalist but I don't know, but uh, from somebody in Europe, probably in Scandinavia. Um, and they, the guy goes, I'm coming to America to meet you, meet Carl. And Gary says, don't come. Then he lands in New York. I'm in New York, I'm on my way to meet you. And Gary says, don't come. And then he lands in California, same mm. thing. And then he's in Grants Pass and he's at the door. You know, uh, uh, Gary told a story about Carl only did maybe four conventions, three or four uh, that I know of. Um, um, and uh, they were at the San Diego Comic Con one year. Uh, unfortunately, not a year I went. And, um, you know, Carl's in the shower and there's fans knocking on the door and uh -huh. Gary's telling them go away. And, you know, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, it, you know, and he really was world famous again, yeah. not as well known in this country, but, um, um, yeah, it's, it's clearly, it's not why he was doing the work. He wasn't doing it to become world famous. He never was doing it that way at all. Oh, no. So, yeah. Oh, God, no. That's uh, something that happened on him, but it was not something he asked for. Um, or to become rich. Um, yeah. He... Well, let's... Go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to, I was going to move on and just start talking a little bit about his background and how his sure. career got started. 
if I could. Sure. Um, so it's your well, podcast, Scott, go for it. <laughs> well, you were about to talk money. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll get into the paintings later. Yeah. Yeah, we will. <laughs> I was good. That is a question I was going to ask. It was definitely with the paintings, but I'm very interested in the paintings that will be coming. Um, but anyway, uh, so he, his career really started around 1935 when he was, uh, uh, took a job at the Walt Disney Studios uh, down in Los Angeles. Prior to that, uh, he he never actually had a formal art training education. He took some correspondence courses, courses, but he never even completed those. I don't even think he went past the eighth grade um, as far as in a basic education as well. Um, I do, I think we, we had discussed, he worked somewhere, I think it was, was it in Calgary? Uh, Canada? No, no, he were well. He had a lot of jobs. He did, I mean, yeah. Oh, just oh, just but, odd but jobs. Not, not in the business, right? Uh, in the comics or uh, animation, but which he cited he, as maybe he, something that did. helped him later on when he was oh, doing yeah, all that absolutely. stuff with Uncle Scrooge. He had he had firsthand knowledge of some of the crazy stuff Scrooge was doing from his absolutely. own life. Absolutely. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, he did work for. The Calgary Eye Opener, which was in Minneapolis, uh, headquarters in Minneapolis, and it was basically a risque joke book where any draw little sexy jokes and so forth. I don't, I don't know too much about that, but okay. um, um, but th- I think that's where he was when he submitted uh, his stuff to Disney. So that's what he was doing right before Disney. Yeah, and you know, at that time, Disney was really just coming into its own as a studio, and it was, the word would kind of get out. Oh, you have some talent. You should go check out that guy, Walt Disney. We're talking, you know, kind of depression era kind of thing, and that's when that that, that studio was going strong. So when he got to Disney, um, he kind of ended up in the gag story department. Yeah, that's that's where they 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 felt his talents were best, rather than I'm, in animation. I'm... I've got to interrupt you there. I okay. think he actually, he didn't start out in the gag department. I don't uh, think, so. I think you're right. Yes. He, I think he might've even been an in-betweener. Uh, oh, he draws, okay. I'm not sure, but I, he was drawing, I think that would have been where they would start a journeyman, I would think, uh, as an in-betweener where you're drawing the movements in between the key movements in the mm-hmm. animation. Yes. Um, so a lot of uh, people start out that way right right um uh from what i read and i don't have all the details on this but this is kind of how i i i I fit it in was you're you're correct in that and he had done some kind of a gag drawing that got kind of passed around or recognized at the studio and it had something to do with donald duck and it had something to do with um like a, a, a shoe polishing machine or something. And he had done a gag where Donald was upside down. So it was actually polishing his head instead of his feet and, and something like that. And that someone saw that and, and thought it was really funny. And that kind of led to him getting retracked over that way. You know, there are people who know Carl's biography uh, better than me, but the way I've always understood it was, and um, is uh, he submitted a gag for, um, there was an animation, uh, animated short called, a Donald Duck animated short called uh, Modern Inventions where Donald's going around and um, I think it's 1937 and He's going around and seeing all these inventions and, you know, and so forth. And I remember that one. Yeah, yeah. That's where Carl, and Carl knew about it or something, and he submitted a gag for the uh, short. Okay. And um, the, the crux of that gag is a little bit different. Um, I mean, they did end up with him getting... Uh, Base essentially ended up in blackface, but um, he there's a barber chair, and and of course barber shops did every you know they hair the shoes and so forth back in those days, but um, and 
So I close my eyes when I'm concentrating really hard. I'll try not to do that so much. But anyway, he, so, and the gag was that uh, he's in this bar automatic mated barber chair and it kind of pops and he ends up upside down. So the, the barber chair is combing his, his bottom and uh, shaving it and part, you know, just parting the hair and, yeah, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, reportedly love Disney loved butt jokes. So yes, <laughs> I've went. heard. <laughs> I, I, I right. can give you, I can cite examples. So right. yes, there's numerous right. examples, and not not in the later Disney stuff, but in the early, and mm -hmm. um, um, and it did end up with the shoe shine part getting onto his black onto his face which you know and uh, so he got paired a lot uh, he worked with a lot of, a lot of different gag artists but one of the ones that he worked with quite a bit was jack hanna who eventually in his own right kind of went into directing with shorts and stuff after uh carl barks left uh, mm -hmm. the studios um and i was reading an interview by jack hanna um and I, I think it was even an interview by Jim Corkins, actually. And, mm. um, and he said he was kind of describing a little bit of his own impressions about Carl Barks and that he was kind of a loner kind of guy, kind of quiet, worked very hard, but like when just kind of kept to himself a little, uh, for the most part. And when other artists uh, in, uh, at the studio were taking breaks, he just didn't do a lot of that and kind of stayed at his desk and just kept drawing gags and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I was curious at this point, I wanted to ask you if based off of just the shorts that he had worked on, is there any short cartoon that had a Karl Barks gag that is like you remember as being one of your favorites? Is there anything that stands out? Um, you know, to be honest, uh, it's been years since I've watched any of the shorts, so I don't, you know, my, it, I don't remember. The, the one that stood out, and I knew you were going to ask me about this, was that, was the one I just discussed, uh, because okay. it was so critical to his career, and because it was a butt joke, which I <laughs> So I have one that I, I, I read right. about and I remember I didn't I didn't entirely remember that it was his and then I read that it was but I, I always loved this little sequence here and this oh. is from <laughs> this is from uh, um, uh, Truant Officer Donald where, where Donald is playing a truant officer and he has to get the nephews back to school who are trying to play hooky uh, and you, it sounds like you're familiar with this sequence here but Basically how this whole scene went. And he yeah. did this with Jack Hanna. This is their gag together. Right. And uh, so the nephews have kind of walled themselves up into the into a house. And Donald's on the outside. So he gets the idea of getting them out of the house by smoking them out, creating a fire like well underneath the house and just smoking them out. Well, the nephews being what they were in these shorts, they, they, they countered that by um, you, pulling three uh, ducks or, or chickens or whatever they are uh, out of the pantry and then sticking them in the bed to make it look like he literally smoked their hides and turned them into food and put their caps there as you can see. Right. And then it went even further to where, and of course they had disappeared and then they were on the roof. So then they dressed up Huey in flour and put and, and hung them off a fishing pole and make them look like he was an angel, like a deceased he, he was dead and came back as an angel being. And I remember reading about that. And um, Harry Reeves, who was kind of like the head of the story department, was just horrified about their gag. He was like, we can't put that in there. You, you got them just like burned to a crisp and then they come back from the dead. Are you crazy? <laughs> and uh, uh, Jack Hanna and Carl Barks fought hard for it. You know, they're like, no, you got to do this. It's going to be great. I can't believe it stayed. I can't believe that they got yeah. away with it. But I mean, this is, uh, so is this a good insight into the kind of humor of Carl Barks? Because it is a little dark. It is dark. And his work, um, one of the things that makes it so interesting is that there are dark moments. There are some of the villains are really villains, and and there's real danger in these things. And all the stuff that is hard to get into kids' comics, 
uh, or I prefer all ages comics, but let's, we'll call them kids comics for now. But um, um, I think Georgia will back me up on this. This kind of what you just described in this cartoon, there's no way a licensed uh, comic would have something like, uh, a kid's comic would have something like that these days. No, no way. So, so, <laughs> so much more guarded today. Than, yeah. than they were. They yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, I don't mean that things should be dark, but... Uh, this is no worse than you'd find in a, in a, in a standard Chuck Jones cartoon or, right. or even like a Tex Avery. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's cool. not, but you wouldn't find any of that kind of thing in the in modern storytelling either. It's Right. Because these cartoons have really have a showcase of a lot of violence back and forth. And we're, we're going to get into that in more detail. But yeah. Okay. <laughs> this is, this yeah, isn't wait. going to be a vanilla <laughs> but interview. We're, we're going to get into some nitty gritty here. But um, yeah. So anyway, this is, this was a, this is a moment that stuck in my mind. It's something that, and there's these are the kind of things that I loved with Disney shorts, and these are one of the reasons that the Donald Duck shorts eventually eclipsed Mickey Mouse as far as popularity, because they could just get they they could the the conflict that Donald could get into was just a lot more interesting than what anything they were willing to do with Mickey Mouse. So. I I totally agree. Um, unfortunately, Mickey becoming there. I don't know, I've got a story to tell you about Mickey when I, cause I was supposed to do the first graphic novel uh, Mickey Mouse story and that went awry, but um, uh, which I guess I could go into now, if we get to it, we'll get to it, but. Um, well, I'm probably not gonna get, I don't know if I'm gonna get back into Mickey again. So you might as well go ahead and tell it. Oh, well, you were gonna talk about censorship. I, I oh, I, okay, we'll save it for the censorship part. We yeah, yeah, censorship. yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you can't do comics. I, I, I will fess up that I know some of the I know some of the areas we're going to go into. <laughs> yeah. But um, can I finish up a few things I was going to say from uh, meeting Carl that first time? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, my memory isn't great, but there's a few things I remember. But um, one was um, okay. So Bill. Uh, Van Horn is about, he says he shrunk down to 6'1", but he used to be 6'2". Carl and he were about the same height. And they're standing next to each other. And all of a sudden, it was probably, I don't know if it was Bill or Carl, but one of them starts kind of standing up taller and the other one stands up taller. And they were trying to out height each other, which was hilarious. I wish I had a, a video of that. Um, um, and, and that's Bill in the picture, by the way, too. This, this oh, is yeah, Bill that's Van Bill Van Horn. Horn. Yes. And that's me back when I had color in my on my face. Um, uh, <laughs> um, let's see. I, I guess that was the, the main thing I wanted to. And, and um, while we... Carl was very gentlemanly. He was very courteous. He was kind of mischievous, as I, as you could tell from that story. Um, we did a little shop talk. Uh, the girl, the ladies went off and talked on their own, where Carl was very polite, as I said, about stuff. He wouldn't say anything bad about any boy, anybody, but Gary was it meanwhile was spilling the dirt to uh, our wives and I won't go I won't go into the dirt but <sighs> don't but it was very interesting <laughs> <laughs> so anyway okay um so I'm curious that with um his years at the studio, I think he spent about seven years at the Disney Studios. Do you think, this is actually your opinion here, but do you think that his work the, during those years to writing gags for Donald Duck, did that play an active role in developing him into the comic artist that he became? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. How so? I mean, because really the way, I mean, I, I'm going to get into this again a little bit more too, but the way he approached the ducks in comic book form, I think are very different from the way 
he was regimented into working them into the strips. I mean, into the shorts. And so um, he, at some point, he, he really made conscious decisions to start making real, some real changes because he could uh, to these characters. Right. Um, the first, uh, his first time out was, uh, well, the first time he got to do his own, one of his own stories, as opposed to working from somebody else's uh, script or, 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 you know, or adapting uh, something, uh, was in his second comics and stories, um, which is, were 10 pagers back then. And um, you can, he, he immediately made changes in Donald where, you know, he had, he had to make changes in Donald because um, Donald's this character in the animation where you can barely understand him, which is funny. You can understand him, but it's, it's very muddled. And, and that doesn't cross over in comics. Obviously. No, it doesn't cross over at all well. Yeah, um, and um, I, I will say that when I saw the first DuckTales, I was a little, the thing that startled me the most was that Scrooge had a Scottish brogue because I was used to seeing him in the comics just right, saying, talking like, we all do, you know, I mean, there wasn't any accent marks or, um, you know, Brogan is, is uh, talk. So um, anyway, but, you know, it's, Carl streamlined all that and made it clear, but uh, getting back to your question, um, he, I think it was really important because uh, the animation, because it gave him the training um, he was used to, he learned how to develop a, a visual gag, then to extend that gag into the next gag and then into the next gag and the next gag. His early um, comics and stories were essentially gag stories. And I think this is somewhat true throughout his career, but Carl would decide what kind of a story he wanted to do, whether it was a uh, an adventure or something, and he would come up with bits of business, and then he would build this, and he would try to figure out how many gags he could come up with, visual gags, and then he would string them together, and um, then he'd create a story out of that, mm -hmm. and which is sort of what he did, uh, they did at the uh, studio, but uh, he was such an artist at turning that all into a story that builds towards an ending. And one of the other things um, I think he got uh, was uh, a great sense of structure, story structure, which um, I honestly, I don't see great story structure in a lot of um, the newer kids comics. Um, there are more events that happen and yeah. you know, they just kind of peter to an end. Um, so no, I think, and, and, um, as you can, as you're showing here, <laughs> this is a great example, the stories, the animated stories, um, they could be a little bit dark, maybe mm -hmm. not <laughs> usually as dark as this, but, um, they were pitched for all ages. And that's, even though he was writing comics for kids, I think there's an all ages uh, component to that. And the other most important thing is at some point he was writing for himself. And if you're writing for yourself and you've got a good sense of story, then you're, never, you're just gonna be fine no matter what. So when, um, getting back briefly to Jack Hanna, what, another thing that he sure. said about Karl Barks that I thought was really interesting, describing him, uh, his approach to writing gags was that he was unique to some of the other gag writers there at mm. the studios and that he wouldn't just follow a catalog of gags. That's not the way he wanted to do it. Um, so when he was writing gags, his gags were very 
tailored to the plot and the story moments. Right. He wasn't going to just throw in a banana, stepping on a banana trip gag right. just for the sake of it. Right. That, to him, that was, that was pointless and that wasn't very fun. So his gags, and this is true through his comics too, were he'd have funny things in there, but they were funny things because they were part of the moment of the story and the journey, as opposed to just taking you out of the story to do something outrageous. And in fact, there was another thing too, and that with, with Barks, the way that he described once or, or a couple of times about the right approach in his mind, to doing uh, the drawing the ducks in the comics is not to go to such extremes uh, of emotions like that. You'd see those in, especially the earlier Donald Duck cartoons, the famous temper tantrum, you know, mm -hmm. flailing arms. He would not do that as a rule unless it was in a really critical moment that would call for that in his books. And, you know, he would say, he, he would even call out some other uh, artists just saying like, don't do that so much because it's not, it's too distracting to the storytelling moments to just constantly be going extreme mm -hmm. with your reactions and your emotions throughout the story. So I thought that was a really interesting point. Um, also, he, you know, he mentioned as far as like, a couple of things about the studio that I thought was interesting. Like one, they all knew Walt. So that I thought it was interesting that there's this, there wasn't really much of a, a set connection between Walt Disney himself and Carl Barks other than saying it's like, oh yeah, Walt would come in and we would have to pitch our shorts to Carl, to Walt Disney, you know, Carl right. Barks and I. And he said that the way that you knew and, and you've heard this, a lot of people have heard this uh, over and over, is that the way you knew you were on Walt's good side is if he just didn't talk about you. <laughs> so like you're, you're doing fine because he's not getting involved in being, and, and it, the more you hear your voice being talked about, then that's when you're like, uh-oh, <laughs> I'm doing something wrong. And he said that in all of his career, that he says that everyone kind of screwed up some more or less at some point. It, where you, you hear like Walt Disney was wrong about something about Jack Hanna did this or, or whatever. And, uh, but he said he never heard that about Carl Barks. Never heard once uh, Walt Disney say anything uh, uh, about Carl Barks, uh, uh, you know, in any kind of a negative way. And um, said that there would be things that he, he could be hard, to, Walt Disney could be hard to please in the story gag sessions because he, he could just like completely flip on a dime he would describe like they would sit there and they would just start brainstorming gags, the three of them uh, over shorts. And they, you know, Walt Disney would get into it, he'd be acting it out. And then at the end of the whole sequence, they'd be like, oh, great. So we're gonna put that into this, into the, the cartoon here. And then Walt will go, nah, we're not gonna do that. <laughs> <laughs> After about 10 minutes of acting something out. That would kill me, that would kill me. <laughs> um, but, um, Ultimately, um, the studio environment, and again, this is kind of according to Jack Hanna, was just not really a great uh, assessment for uh, uh, Carl Barks. He, again, he kind of described him as a loner. He really liked the, the autonomy of being able to work alone. At that mm -hmm. time, the, the, um, they were expected to put out a single cartoon worth of storyboards in about six weeks. So they were producing a finished cartoon every six weeks. And um, that was, it just wasn't, he, he didn't like that kind of grind. It, it kind of seemed apparent, you know, he'd do it and he could pull it off, but he wasn't really enjoying that part of it a ton. And um, so he ended up leaving the studios in 1942, 1943, partly for that reason, because another opportunity came up. 